Good morning, church. Welcome back to the locker room. We're in Hebrews chapter 12, learning to run the race before us, the race with endurance. We're talking about the faith race. Hebrews chapter 12, this is your first day with us. We've actually spent several months going line by line, verse by verse, through this New Testament book of Hebrews. We've come really to the climax of the book. We're just a few weeks away from breaking the tape on the book of Hebrews altogether. But there's so much more to learn about how to run this race. Hebrews 12, verse 1, once again. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. This is part two of a two-part message of running with endurance, having a faith that endures. And what we're learning is there's others that have gone before us. In fact, Hebrews 11, what we've called Heaven's Hall of Faith, is full of names that we have learned from. Those that have broke the tape on their race, they have run their race. And now we also, he says, must run our race. And we've talked about names like Moses and Jacob and Abraham and Sarah and those of antiquity that have gone before us and they've ran with endurance and tenacity. But you understand, there are people like that even among us today. And that's why there are other names on jerseys up here. I want to recognize uh, someone that a lot of you may not have heard of, but Terry and Wanda Allen. Guys, Terry and Wanda Allen watch from home now because of uh, health reasons. But Terry and Wanda Allen were a part of our, um, of our church in the early, early days. And it was uh, actually 25 years ago, this week, that I received a phone call that would change my life forever. Been going to this little church plant called Liberty. It was in Lee Summit. A man named Don Carney called me up. I was on duty at the police department at the time. I said, Phil, I've got bad news. Our pastor has resigned. Will you come preach Sunday morning just one time? That was 25 years ago. Yeah. And Terry and Wanda, I think I have a picture of them somewhere here. Terry and Wanda Allen. Oh, there it is. Terry and Wanda actually was a part of our church in the early days. And I could argue today that there would be no abundant life were not for Terry and Wanda Allen. They're watching right now online. Would you give it up for them? Terry and Wanda. You have run the race, and I'm so grateful. So let me tell you about Terry. So Terry was on our board at the time, and God called me to preach, called me to pastor, and I knew God had called me to uh, lead a church and had no idea it'd be here, didn't know it'd be now. But Terry, as an older gentleman, took this young man under his wing, believed in me when there was absolutely no reason to believe, trusted me to be his pastor when there was no really reason to, untested, untrained. And as a member of our board, he kind of mentored me. So about you know two or three months in, uh, to me pastoring this little church, he came to me and said, hey, Pastor Phil, are we ever gonna have a, a board meeting, you know, finance committee meeting? I said, what's that? <laughs> Never heard of it. I had no idea there was such a thing as bylaws. I'd heard of the Bible, didn't know there was church bylaws. Had no idea church organization, church administration. So uh, Terry Allen kind of mentored me through basically how to run a church and do it with integrity, right? And uh, so Terry, I am so grateful for your life, the way you have run your race. Hey, I wanna share one more today, guys. Uh, This jersey here is for Dave and Susan Williams. Dave and Susan uh, came to our church back in 2006. Dave is retiring after 18 and a half years as our CFO and business administrator. Dave, would you come up here right now? And Susan, would you give a hand to them? You have run so faithfully. You guys have run with such integrity, such tenacity. Now, when it comes to serving Jesus, there is no retirement, only redefinement. So uh, while Dave is retiring from our staff, he's still going to be a part of our missions and leading trips to Asia. And uh, I am so deeply grateful. Dave, these are for you. Thank you. I'm kidding. (laughs) Now, let me tell you what this is from your church family for 18 and a half years of running so faithfully. And uh, Dave loves to bike. And uh, he is a very avid biker. As a matter of fact, I've just started biking recently. And we went on a ride recently. And he's several years older than I am. But he went blowing by me. (laughs) Honestly, it was so deflating, (laughs) I have to say. But what this is from your church family is a gift to a local bike shop here in town to go get your dream bike for retirement. Love you, man. So grateful for Dave and Susan. 
um, couldn't be what we are without them. I'm so grateful for those that have gone before us and run so well, those that are still running with us like Dave and Susan. Hey, you know what? We have an opportunity also to literally walk in the footsteps of some of these Christians of antiquity that I want to invite you to do something uh, next year right here. If you'll just scan this QR code, we're going to be going to Greece on a footsteps of the Apostle Paul tour October 2025. So for years we've tried to go to Israel. We like going to the Holy Land, uh, but because it seems like something happens every time we do, like a war or something, we're going to pivot and we're going to go on a Footsteps of Paul adventure tour through uh, Greece. And we're literally going to walk in the steps of those early Christians as they ran their race. And I want to invite you to come on this. It's like a discipleship trip, discovery trip. It'll be a pilgrimage of sorts as we will literally stand in the stadium mentioned in Acts 19 where Paul stood. Uh, we will literally stand in Corinth, in the ruins of Corinth, before the Bema seat the Apostle Paul writes of. Uh, we will literally stand on Mars Hill next to the Parthenon in Athens where Paul preached. Uh, we will go to the island of Patmos where the Apostle John was exiled. And so that's October 2025. want to just encourage you to go and maybe be a part of that. So it's a lot of money, but it's all inclusive and I'll promise a trip of a lifetime. It will enlighten you and spiritually you will see things that you only have known in your mind's eye by faith. It will become sight as we begin to see these ancient Christians and what they did to take the gospel to the nations. In some way, that's what's going on in Hebrews 12.1 when he says these words, we also are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Those that have gone before us from antiquity, those that have run the race even now with us, uh, right at this very moment, we also, he says, now must lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily ensnares us so that we can run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Now, I told you last week, sometimes this race of faith is certainly not a sprint, like it's not something that you finish in a day. It's over the course of a lifetime. And in some way, it's a relay race. Like one day we're gonna pass the baton of faith to the next generation and we will break the tape. But right now, this is our race. This is our time. This is our run. And so consequently, we're learning how to run with endurance so that our faith doesn't grow weary, so that we have a faith of tenacity that really tests the time and it stands up in the face of adversity. And so what I said last week, guys, is sometimes it's more like a walk. It's not just a sprint. Sometimes it's not even a run. The New Testament describes this race sometimes as a very long walk. In fact, over and over again, you see this phrase in the New Testament, learning to walk with God. In other words, one day at a time, like one step at a time and one decision at a time. I just got back from Glacier National Park, five days in the back country, 57 miles. And this is a picture of my son and I that was on the trip there in Glacier. And this is what I think of when I think of Hebrews 12, 1, when he says, lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily ensnares us so that we can run with endurance. So this is the pack I used in Glacier on this very long walk. Um, and I told you last week that every single one of us in some way is wearing one of these every day. You wore one of these in to church today. You'll take this home with you today. You'll take this to work with you tomorrow. You'll wear this to bed tonight. You know what I'm talking about? I'm talking about the weight of life that you carry. We all wear a backpack 24 seven. It's not one you can see, but it's one that is just as real as the one you can see. It's the, it's the weight of life that you carry. It's the weight of stress. It's the weight of responsibility. It's the weight of the headaches. It's the weight of the heartbreaks. And this is what is in view. There's some weight you have to carry through life and that weight actually makes you stronger. See, if you want a faith that endures, you have to have a faith that actually has to endure. But there's a lot of way, what we're learning is that you carry that you shouldn't carry. This is why he says, lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily ensnares you. And so last week, uh, we took a little inventory. And what I learned about doing a backcountry adventure like the one I did in Glacier is you've got to pack very carefully. Like every single ounce matters. You don't want to carry anything you don't need. Like even an ounce doesn't sound like much, but over the course of 57 miles and five days, what you carry can begin to wear you down, wear you out. And so I've learned to pack very carefully, only take exactly and only what you need. So he said, lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily ensnares you. 
and we took a little inventory of our pack last week. What are some weights that you're carrying? I talked last week about the weight of debt and personally have made decisions to try to free myself financially, to do some things with kingdom priorities so I'm not personally laden down with too much debt. I talked uh, last week about uh, the weight of maybe unforgiveness. This is a big one. Many of us are carrying the weight of unforgiveness. And here's what happened. I went home, as I hope you did, and took a little inventory of my backpack. And guess what I found out? There's a little bit of unforgiveness on my own life. I understand, when it comes to unforgiveness and choosing forgiveness, it doesn't always guarantee reconciliation. Sometimes that's not an option. But forgiveness is always an option. And even a little bit of unforgiveness in your life is just a little weight over the course of a long journey that will start to weigh you down and wear you out. So what are some weights that maybe you should lay down? Let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily ensnares us so that we can run with endurance the race that is set before us. You need to learn to pack very carefully in this long walk called life. And what I want you to see this week is simply this. Listen carefully. Jesus will chasten you until you lay down that weight or sin you refuse to lay down. Like right now, he says, take an inventory of your pack. What are some sins? What are some weights that you're carrying around that you need to lay down? See, the sin will tear you down, and it's the weight that you carry that will weigh you down. And when I think of the weight, it's not necessarily a sinful thing. That's the obvious thing. But the weight is sometimes good things that simply keep you from the better things, the greater things. And that's why he wants us all to do a little introspection of how we pack as we walk through this life so that we're not living in such a way as to be worn out and torn down so that we fizzle out or blow out. He wants us to break the tape. He wants us to have a faith that runs the race with endurance. But check it out. Listen, Jesus will chasten you until you lay down that weight or sin you refuse to lay down. Meaning, if you won't lay it down on your own, Jesus has his ways. Trust me, I know, he has his ways. Now, it's not because he's against you, he is for you. It's not because he's not for you, he loves you. He loves you so much that he's not gonna let you carry that sin or that weight around forever. Lay it down of your own free will or he will chasten you until you do. Why? Because he wants you to break the tape. He wants you to run with no regret. He wants you to break the tape with no retreat. He wants you to run with endurance the race that is set before you. So I want you to see what happens next. If you don't lay it down, eventually you will. Look at what it says here in verse three. It says this, for consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You have not yet resisted the bloodshed striving against sin. You know what he's saying here? Look, you think you got it bad? Nobody's crucified you yet. Consider him who endured such hostility, though he'd done no sin, he'd done no wrong. They hung him on a cross. He's trying to say, look, you you guys think you've got it really rough? Listen, consider Jesus, who did nothing wrong, yet he still got nailed to a cross. That kind of puts it in perspective, doesn't it? Now he goes on, he says this, and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges Every son he who he receives, and if you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons, for what son is there whom a father does not chasten? Now, what is this chastening? What does that word even mean? Remember, it's all about learning to lay down the sin, lay down the weight that would encumber us and ensnare us so that we fizzle out or blow out and we don't break the tape with endurance. And so here's the process. In our own life, when we refuse to lay down that weight or sin, there's the chastening that comes from the Lord, the chastening that comes from above. Now, what is this chastening? What does it mean? Listen carefully. The Lord's chastening is not the same as punishment. This is a word that means discipline or correction. Once you understand something, even as a child of God, when you've been born again, you place your faith in Jesus that he died for your sin and rose again. You need to recognize something. Even when you sin, check this out. God's not punishing you for sin. You know why? Because Jesus took all of our punishment for all of our sin 
and took all of our penalty. See, the gospel is not God punishes Jesus and you for your sin. The gospel is Jesus got punished for your sin, period. And the perfect justice of God was satisfied in him. So I want you to recognize what we're talking about here. This is not about punishing you for sin because Jesus took your punishment. Chastening is something different. Chastening, this word, means discipline. It means correction, something altogether. It's not punitive. It's not because God is mad at you. He's not angry at you. And by the way, this should change the way we think about disciplining our children. Like God spanks his children. That's what chastening means. But he doesn't do it because he's angry. He doesn't do it because he's mad at you constantly and you can never measure up. He's doing it to discipline you as a father to a child to correct you, not to punish you. Uh, when I was, uh, when I was uh, playing football at the University of Kansas, hold the jokes, okay? Hold the jokes. This, I'm, I'm, I'm being real right now, okay? So people ask sometimes, well, why'd you go to play for Kansas, kid that grew up in Missouri? I didn't go to play for a Kansas. I went to play for a coach. That's why I ended up at Kansas. His name was Bob Valicenti, who recruited me. He was a player's coach. He loved his players. That's why I went to Kansas. The problem is you don't get paid a lot of money as a head coach on Division One level for loving your players. You gotta win a lot of football games. And he didn't win a lot of football games. So he got fired after my first year. And I lost my coach. A new coach came in by the name of Glenn Mason. Now, we didn't like Glenn Mason, and we didn't think Glenn Mason liked us. He was not a player's coach. Now, I found out later he actually did like us. He did care about his players. Uh, he treated me very kindly when I had a career-ending injury and couldn't play anymore. But I didn't know at the time. You know why? He came in that first meeting. He said these words to the entire team. We're going to find out who the winners are from the quitters. We're gonna separate the quitters from the winners, and that's exactly what he did over the next years. He did care about his players, but he knew what it was gonna to take to turn a losing program into a winning program. And every once in a while, we'd be at practice, and he would blow the whistle, and he would announce, all right, we're getting up, run the hill in the morning. Guess why? Because we jumped offside too many times, or somebody ran the wrong play instead of running the right play, or somebody you know, just kind of a, wasn't paying attention when they should have been paying attention, and next thing you know, he'd blow the whistle, middle of practice, he'd announce, all right, running the hill in the morning, we get up, before classes, oh, dark 30, we'd all run across the campus, which was bad enough already. And on the other side of the campus, there was a hill about 200 yards long and a very, very steep grade. And we would start to run that hill over and over and over again. We would run that hill till we threw up. We would run that hill till we thought we were going to die. We would run that hill till we wished we would die. I mean, we'd run that hill over and over again. It was awful. It was painful. To this day, I don't like that man. No, I'm kidding about that part. I'm kidding about that part. He knew what he was doing. Listen very carefully. An undisciplined team is not a winning team. What he was doing was chastening the team. He was chastening us. Why? Because a winning team is a disciplined team. That's the nature of chastening. Do you understand an undisciplined life is a losing life? An undisciplined life is not a life that will break the tape with no regret. An undisciplined life is not a life that will run this race with endurance and not look back. See, Jesus chastens you in the same way a coach chastens his team, not to punish you, but to discipline you so you live a disciplined life because a disciplined life is a winning life. And he wants you to win in life. He's not against you, he's for you. You see, that's the nature of this word chastening. It's the correction. It's the conviction. He's quoting here in Hebrews from Proverbs. He's actually quoting this verse right here, Proverbs 3, 11 through 12. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor detest his correction. For whom the Lord, everybody say this, whom the Lord loves, he corrects just as a father, the son in whom he delights. You know what I learned playing football many years ago? As long as the coach was barking at you, he actually still cared about you. You better watch it when all of a sudden he pays you no attention and doesn't say a thing. Because he's given up on you. No, in this case, you've got a heavenly father that will never give up on you. 
And he is gonna chasten you. He is gonna correct you. If you will not lay down that sin on your own or that weight on your own that encumbers you, that ensnares you, that's gonna wear you out or blow you out so you don't break the tape, listen carefully. He's gonna correct you till you do. See, that conviction, that discipline. So what does that look like in my own life? It should be the same in your life as a child of God. You have the Holy Spirit living within you, meaning when I sin, the Holy Spirit immediately blows the whistle. Hey, just like my coach in the middle, somebody jump off sides one too many times, he blow the whistle. We're about to be chastened in the morning. That's not what he called it, but that's what it was. When the Holy Spirit blows the whistle, what do you do? I can tell you personally, when I sin, the Holy Spirit blows the whistle immediately. Now what happens next? What you do next, well, you'll decide how long the chastening goes. See, it begins with conviction. Now listen carefully, condemnation is not the same as conviction. Condemnation comes from Satan. Conviction comes from the Holy Spirit. Shame is not the language of the Savior, all right? Shame is meant to drive you into secrecy. The strength of any sin is in the secrecy. No, that's not the language of the Savior. That's not the language of the Holy Spirit. Conviction is different than guilt. If you still feel guilty for sins committed years ago that you've long since confessed to Jesus, it's been forgiven by him, it is under the blood, and all is cleansed, and you still feel guilty, that's not from the Holy Spirit. That's from a different spirit. But conviction is something else. You should feel conviction when you sin as a child of God. The Spirit of God lives within you for that reason. But if you continue to sin and you don't heed that conviction, now you put yourself in a position of chastening. And that might come through any number of situations, trials, tribulations. Now listen carefully. Every time you go through a time of sadness or season of suffering, doesn't necessarily mean it's God's chastening on sin. We happen to live in a world that's cursed by sin, and where there is sin, suffering comes for all men and all women. And it may or may not be chastening for sin, but that suffering, that pain, it should cause us all to take inventory and look in the backpack and say, Jesus, is there something you want me to change? Is there anything in my life I'm carrying around that you want me to lay down? And there may not be, not always. But if you take some inventory, you have a little introspection, you examine your backpack, at times you're going to find there is something in your life that God wants you to lay down, something he wants you to let go of, something he wants you to let go and turn around. It's called repentance. And this is what happens to all Christians. This is the, this is the, this is the thing that the Holy Spirit does in us all. And listen carefully now, the evidence you're truly God's child is that he convicts you and corrects you of sin. Meaning if you can sin with no sense of conviction and no sense of correction, it could mean that you're not even a Christian. Look at what it says next, the next verse, verse eight. But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you're illegitimate and not sons. Now I've heard it said there's no such thing as illegitimate children, just illegitimate parents. But when you think of that phrase, an illegitimate child, you think of a child without a father. Meaning there are people who profess Christ, they don't really possess Christ. Have you ever wondered why the world is full of people who claim to be Christians, they just live anything like a Christian? I mean, why is the world so full of people who claim to be Christians, but their lifestyle is completely pagan? I mean, it's a paradox theologically. It's an impossibility theologically. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Basically what that means is, if you still are what you were, you probably ain't. Now, it doesn't mean you don't struggle with sin. Of course you do. I do too. It doesn't mean you will struggle with temptation. Of course you do. I do too. As a pastor, I don't worry about the people who say, Phil, I know I'm a Christian, but I still struggle with sin. We all do. I worry about people as a pastor who claim to be a Christian, but when they sin, there is no struggle. Does that make sense? 
Because whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son or every daughter whom he receives. And he that is without chastening is an illegitimate son. If you can sin and win with no conviction, no sense of correction, you need to have a little self-examination. This is the meaning of 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 5. It says, examine yourself whether you be in the faith. Test yourself whether or not you be disqualified. He's speaking here of the race, and we're all running the race. And some can be disqualified from the race because because they thought they were in the right race and the entire time they're in the wrong race. And one day they're gonna get to the end of the race and find out they may have professed Christ, they never actually possessed Christ, they've been baptized but not born again. They claim to be a Christian but they never become a new creation. And so the evidence in my own life, guys, that I know Jesus, that I'm really born again as a son of the living God, not that I'm a pastor, that's just a title, not that I prayed the sinner's prayer at six years of age and got baptized. Anybody can do that. Baptism can just make you wet. The evidence in my own life that I really am a child of God is one, I'm not what I ought to be, I'm not what I wanna be, but I know I'm not what I used to be. There is the faith that saved me and it is a faith that continues to change me. And when I sin, I have conviction. And I do sin. I still struggle with sin. Like I know I'm a wretch without Jesus. I'm a mess without Jesus. I shudder to think where I'd be without Jesus. And this is what he wants you to see, that, that as a child of God, you will be chastened from above. We all are chastened. How you respond in times of chastening, how you respond in times of all suffering and all pain, whether it's chastening for sin or a weight that you need to lay down, or you just happen to live in this cursed world that's been cursed by sin and suffering eventually comes for all men and all women, how you respond in seasons of pain will define your future. It's either gonna make you harder, it's gonna make you humble. And what God wants to do through suffering is empty us of ourselves so that we're filled up more with him. I want you to look at what it says in James 1, verses 2 through 4. Look at what it says. My brother, and count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Now, I've told you before, Satan tempts you. It's God who tests you. Those aren't the same thing. The very same thing that Satan wants to use to ruin your faith is the very same thing God wants to use to refine your faith. In the same way fire tests metal to make that metal stronger, the trials of life will test the metal of your faith to make it stronger. In fact, look what it says. Various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, but let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. This word patience, same Greek word as the word in Hebrews 12, 1, endurance. See, what he's teaching us is simply this. In the same way, if you want a body that gets stronger physically, your body must endure some hard things physically. If your body is not enduring some hard things physically, it will naturally atrophy. And in the very same way, your faith can atrophy unless your faith is having to endure some hard things. This is why he says, hey, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing the testing of your faith produces endurance. But let endurance have its perfect work. That word can be translated as patience, endurance, steadfastness. You see, the only way you get a faith that endures is if you have to endure some difficult things, some hard things. So earlier in uh, the summer, back in July, I went with a group of guys out to Colorado and we hiked Mount Elbert, the tallest a mountain in Colorado, second tallest in the lower 48. This is Bart Cox, our senior executive pastor, and me on top of the summit of Mount Elbert. Now, do I look happy there? Do I? Let me tell you something. In that moment, it's all I could do to stand up. It was all I could do to muster up a smile for future posterity so it would look like I had crushed the mountain. Now, let me tell you the backstory. I hadn't crushed the mountain. In fact, the only thing that got me to the top of Mount Albert was pure grit, not because I'm so fit. Listen, I have full disclosure here. I never quit lifting. I never quit working out. I, I've weight trained for 30 years, really weight trained all my life. But I'm the guy that neglected legs and lungs for the last three decades of my life. <laughs> and the mountain does not care about your bench press. Not impressed. 
It is all legs and lungs. So to get ready for this glacier trip I went on, I've actually been training for about nine months, doing cardio for the first time in many, many years. And so the trip to Mount Elber was meant to be a test and a tune-up for Glacier, I was gonna find out where I'm at. I've been in you know, Colorado a couple years in a row now. I've done several 14ers, and I thought this time I have trained and I'm gonna crush this thing. And I was so confident for about the first two miles, I'm out front of a, a group of 12 and I'm their pastor and I'm leading the way and I'm looking back, you guys okay? And yeah, by about mile two, I am gassed. I remember looking at a young group of guys, of course they're in their 20s, Hang on, it'll happen to you too. And I looked at him and said, we're not gonna let those guys pass us. And about 30 seconds later, there they all went. It was all I could do to get up the side of that mountain, guys. You know, have you ever been so mad you cried? I cried on the side of that mountain. I was so mad, so mad. Now, I knew I was going to get up the mountain because I'd rather die than quit. But I really thought I was going to test my fitness and I was going to be further along than I was. I was so disappointed. I had trained for this. I felt like I was failing the test I'd trained for. And I want you to see something. Listen very carefully. When you're on the side of the mountain in life and you don't know how you're gonna get over it, you don't know how you're gonna get through it, you don't know how you're gonna get up it, every test is pass-fail. Listen, if my only goal, my only win is to be the first one up the mountain, I will forever feel like a failure. But that's not how it works. The test God gives you is not comparison with anyone else. It's is your race. It's between you and him. It's not comparison. I felt like I'd failed the test that day, but every single test is pass fail. You only fail if you quit. As long as one day you can break the tape and say as the Apostle Paul, I have fought the good fight, I've kept the faith, I've finished my race, you, you didn't fail. And there are times where I thought in the spiritual life, I'm on the side of the mountain and, and I'm a pastor. I've been 25 years in the ministry now and, and I've been walking with Jesus for over three decades. Like I ought to be farther along in my faith. And on the side of the mountain, when you're in a lot of pain, you're losing your marriage after 30 years you never dreamed you would. Your baby has died. God, why? Why? and you're going through the worst pain of your life, you're full of doubts, fear. Listen, I've gone through seasons like that, and I've thought, God, why am I not further along? Why am I doubting? I should be farther along. I feel like I'm failing. Listen carefully. You're not failing. Just because you have doubts and fears in that moment, you only fail if you quit. It's past fail. And I want you to see how you respond in those times is so, so important. How should you respond through times of sadness and suffering and pain of which no one is the exception, no one gets the exemption, number one, with humility and submission. Humility and submission is how you get up the mountain. Look at what he says next in verse nine. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us and we paid them respect Shall we not much more readily be in subjection or submission to the Father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them, but he for our profit that we may be partakers of his holiness. See, he's trying to work in us a deeper humility which gives us increasingly a life that is holy. Not that you'll be sinless this side of heaven, but that you can sin less. And all of a sudden, your faith is growing. Your faith is, is resilient in the face of pain. Your faith is tenacious in times of suffering. You have a faith that will never grow old and never gives up, and it never gives in. That's what God wants to do, but only if you respond with humility and submission. God, I know you know things I don't know. You can see things I don't see. And I trust you right now that you will perform all that you have promised. See, that's faith. Now, the second thing is this, by trusting God loves me and is for me. See, you can't respond in humility and submission if you don't really believe God is for you, that he loves you. How many times have I heard Pastor Phil, if God loved me so much, 
why does he allow this in my life? Phil, if God is for me, why would he allow this to happen to me? Hey, God gets a lot of credit for things he didn't do. God is not the author of suffering. Sin is the author of suffering. In fact, all human suffering is because of human sin. Either your sin, now you're living the consequences of somebody else's sin committed against you, or Adam's sin, what theologians call original sin. All suffering goes back to sin. God didn't do that, but God makes a promise in the middle of that. Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good for those who love God, for those who are called according to his purpose. No, it's not good when you fought to save your marriage and your spouse still walked away. No, it's not good when that person you love so deeply got sick and died too soon. It's not good. But God makes a promise in some way, all things, even this thing, God can work together for good. And one day when you break the tape, only then will you get to see everything God could see and fully know everything God knew all along. Verse 11, now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who are trained by it. You see, pain in the hands of God is for training, spiritual training, so that we can grow in our faith, a faith that endures hard, hard things. Now, to help me illustrate, I want to have a conversation, locker room conversation today with Bart Cox, who helped me get up that mountain who helped me train for glaciers. So Bart, come on up here. Give it up for Bart right now. Would you guys do that with me? So um, Bart sent me a text, I think prompted of the Holy Spirit, maybe a year ago, knowing Dave Williams was gonna be retiring, uh, came out of the secular job as a CFO, said, hey, I'm wondering. And I said, yes, let's talk. So about nine months ago, we hired Bart as our CFO. He's now our senior executive pastor, personal friend, been a part of our church since 2006, part of our staff now for about nine months, so grateful for him. But let me tell you about Bart. Bart is one of the very rare, unique human beings that loves pain. <laughs> oh, he lives in it, relishes it, not me. So um, I asked Bart, um, would you train me? As my personal friend, a guy that's really elite fitness, he, he really, really is. I'm not, he is. Uh, he mountain bikes. And um, so, you know, I've, I've, I've gotten into the backcountry backpacking, guys. Here's the reason why. I'm never going to run a marathon. You guys are crazy. <laughs> you're, you're, you're crazy. I respect you, just don't understand you, all right? So my marathon once a year is gonna be like a backcountry thing. It's gonna, it's what I need right now, time of my life, to train for something, all right? That's kind of the goal. I want longevity of life, and more importantly, quality of life, and so that's part of the motivator for me. I wanna be able to chase my kids and grandkids up a mountain someday, that kind of thing. Uh, and so I've asked Bart to train me. So sit down here, let's have a locker room conversation together, Bart. Um, I wanna help people see the metaphor between physical training and the pain that comes with it to the spiritual training. What God wants to do in your life spiritually to grow your faith, to make it stronger. So Bart, tell them a little bit about yourself, would you? Yeah, so like you said, uh, Pastor Phil, you know, we've been friends for a while, 18 years or so. You're, you became my pastor, we're friends, you became my boss, and then you invited me to be your trainer. <laughs> and so uh, when, we, when we went up that mountain on Elbert, and you mentioned you were crying. When he mentioned he was crying up there, I was crying up there too, but I was crying for a different reason. I, I had trained you for nine months. I really thought, man, we were gonna just march up that mountain. <laughs> and he's not kidding. I mean, he was in the front. He, he had it going. I mean, we were just, you know, we were living it up. We got up there, and it started to get ugly. And it, uh, Matt Bartle was up there with us, and we got to the point where Matt would walk 10 yards ahead of you, Pastor Phil, and say, you know, Phil, just come to me. And you would get to him, and then you'd rest. And I was kind of behind you. If you stumbled backwards, I was just gonna try to keep you from falling off the edge, right? So 
I was, I was really you upset. You need people like that in your life, guys. <laughs> yeah. Just I mean, be truly, clear. A couple times it was sketchy. But, but, but here's, what, here's, the, here's what happened. Coming down that mountain, I thought, we are going to be ready for Montana. And so if we were just buddies and if we were just in a leisure situation, we would just go have fun and, and ride our bikes and do a little cardio between then and Montana. But that's not what you needed. What you needed was for us to double down. And so what we did was we really scaled it up. And so the, the way I can liken it is if you've seen people cry and you've seen people like ugly cry, well, there's also a difference between cardio and ugly cardio. <laughs> and it, it's, it looks the same. And so we really did, we ramped it up. And we went out and we developed a plan and we executed that plan. And I was so excited for Montana because we, we did, we, we walked 57 miles with 50 plus pounds on our backs, over 10,000 feet of elevation, and you did it. You passed that test. And for me, you know, I, we could have, yeah, yeah, give him, give him a hand. It was great. But I think for me, Pastor Phil, I, you know, it, that illustration of we turned up the heat on you. We made it worse for you in the temporary so that you could experience the joy of Montana. Right, right, right. So good. Hey, guys, a couple things come to mind here. Just, just the parallels, all right? One, I would not do that by myself. I would only do that with community. Like, had I been hiking up Elbert by myself, no way I would have made it to the top. The fact that I had other people. Hey, today happens to be a day where we're calling a connect groups are forming. Mm. Like, if you're going solo, your faith is going to be really weak. you got to have people with you that you're going to walk with through life. That's, right. That's why we put such an emphasis on community. You've got to have that with you to encourage each other, just to keep each other going. And uh, Matt Bartle and Bart was that for me on the side of Elbert. And even right now, guys, when we go out and train, like I haven't trained like this, uh, honestly, since I was probably competing at University of Kansas. Like, we don't normally choose pain. Only a few weirdos do. Okay? Come on, come on. Unique, yeah. But, but most of us don't. We try to, you know, comfort ourselves and preserve ourselves and insulate ourselves from pain. But this is what I know. If, if you want to get stronger physically, your body must endure some painful things. Yeah. If you want to get stronger spiritually spiritually, emotionally, you've got to endure some difficult things. Like discomfort is good for the body. Check this out. Discomfort is good for the soul. It's good for the soul. Even though we don't want it. And there are times God is going to say, I know this is hard, but you need this. So something else comes to mind. Like we got back from Albert. Check it out. He's going to ramp up and make the training more intense, more painful even than it was. I could tell him no any day I wanted. It's true. He can't make me do anything I, mean, I don't want to do. Seriously. <laughs> I have to lose the right yeah. to say no. If I really want to get stronger, I have to willingly submit to him as my trainer. This is what we have to do in the Christian life, guys. We have to give up rights to say, God, no. Yeah. I have to be willing to submit myself to him. We sang it today, I surrender all, the old hymn. Jesus, I surrender all. And what God is trying to do in those times of suffering is to bring us to that place. Or Jesus, I surrender this now too. Greater surrender. What else comes to mind, Bart? Pastor Phil, on that, on that mountain on the way up, I was thinking about, you know, last week you talked about focusing on the finish line. And, and, and I was thinking on the way up that mountain, I wanted, I wanted to ask you this question in front of everybody. I wanted to ask this. What do you tell somebody when the suffering and the despair, the anxiety is so intense that the finish line just isn't even motivational anymore? You know, I, I know there are people, I've been in that stage in my life. I know you've been in that stage in your life. So what, what advice would you have for people to, to get through those acute situations like that? Yeah, the thing I have going for me when we go out and train, um, and a lot of our really, really heavy, hard training is biking, and he'll have me do these four-minute bursts where I'm pedaling as hard as I can for four minutes. Uh, the thing I have going for me is he's telling me the time. Yeah. Two minutes, 
Three minutes, 30 seconds left. Come on, right? Here's the deal. You can do anything as long as you know there's an end to it. Yeah. But some suffering in life, you don't know when it's going to end. Hmm. What then? So my first time out a couple summers back to do a 14er, people told me, well, just focus on the summit. Just keep your eyes on the summit. What I learned right away is that's a horrible idea. <laughs> because you're going through intense pain and with every step, it feels like you're not making any progress. It's still so far away. It's discouraging. Take another step. Doesn't look like you've gone anywhere. What I learned to do is don't focus on the distance. Focus on the next step, one step at a time. Just keep your head down, focused on the next step. So I'm not talking here what to do and just the, the irritations of life, uh, the frustrations of life, the first world problems we all have. I'm talking about problems money can't fix. Your loved one has died and you don't know how you're gonna live without them. Your marriage is over and your life will never be the same. I mean really, really intense pain. Don't focus on what you're gonna do 10 years from now two years from now. Just focus on what you're gonna do two weeks from now, two days from now. One step at a time. And this is what I've learned to do. When I'm on these hikes and I'm in a lot of pain, keep your head down, just like Matt Bartle was ahead of me, 10 steps, another 10 steps, another 10 steps. Here's what happens, one step after another. You're not looking up there, you're just looking here. One day at a time, two weeks at a time, all of a sudden you look up and you're almost there. You look up and you have made progress. Yeah. What I tell people, hey, you can look behind you because then you can see how far you've come. But don't look that far ahead of you. And if you will just look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith, yeah, he's at the finish line somewhere in the future, but he's also right here too. Look unto Jesus, the author and finisher. He'll help you keep taking that next step. Don't worry about 10 years from now, two days from now when you're in a lot of pain and you will be amazed if you do. One day you're gonna look up and you're gonna realize how far you've come. And that's what I want to encourage you to do. The Apostle Paul put it this way, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16. Therefore we faint not. Though our outer man is perishing, the inner man is being renewed day by day. Therefore we do not focus on that which we can see, but on that which we cannot see. For things that are seen is temporal. The things that are not seen is eternal. Your focus will determine your future. Remember what we said, faith is seeing the invisible, but not the non-existent. When you're in a lot of pain, you focus on the prize. And one day, you will receive the prize. Don't focus on the pain. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. What did Jesus do? When the cross loomed in front of him, he focused beyond the cross. The joy was not in the cross. He was about to be tortured to death. No, the joy for Jesus is that he was looking beyond the cross. On the other side of the cross was a crown. Church, listen, if you will endure the cross today, there's a crown someday at the finish line. Galatians 6, 9 says this, don't grow weary in well-doing, for we know in due season we will reap if we faint not. The pain is far again. The abundant life is in the obedient life. There are people right now in a lot of pain, going through really, really intense suffering. At every campus, every church house, right here in Lee Summit, I want you to bow with me right now for just a moment. Today there are these among us that are on the side of that mountain and don't know how they will ever, ever, ever get to the top and beyond and to the other side. It's so hard. Going through a real season of suffering don't know when it's gonna be over. Don't know if it'll ever change. I wanna pray for you right now at every campus, across our city, church house, across our nation. If you'd have the humility right now just to stand to your feet, I wanna pray for you. Would you let us do that? 
to stand to your feet right now. I'm gonna pray. Blue Springs, Crossroads, Independence, Johnson County, join us there. Right here in this Lee Summit Auditorium, just stand to your feet. Going through intense pain, suffering, sadness, loss. Church houses, just stand. Church family, I want you to look up. If you see anybody standing anywhere near you, would you go to them right now? Just, just place your hand on them. I, I want them to know they are not alone. God sees them. Right now, the other campuses, church houses, just look up. If you see somebody standing, I want you to go near them. Just stand up, turn around. Walk toward them. Put a hand on their shoulder. Let them know God sees them right now. And Jesus, I pray for these, your dear sons and daughters. As our Father in heaven, we know it breaks your heart to see your children suffer. But Lord, we believe there is purpose in the pain. That you're able to use it in some way for our greater gain. And I pray blessing over every person right now that had the humility to stand to their feet and say, I need prayer. I pray a double portion of your spirit upon their life. I pray this week on the side of that mountain where it feels like it will never be over, that you'd empower them supernaturally, energize them, encourage them with the Holy Spirit of God upon them, the spirit of all comfort, the God of all comfort be upon them. I pray they would sense the loving arms of the living, loving God upon their life but you'd immerse them, God, in your loving kindness this week in the middle of the situation that has brought them so much suffering and pain. I pray your holy presence would go before them, that your grace would abound upon their life as never before, that they would not grow weary in well-doing, that they would have a faith that endures the test of time that one day they will break the tape. And they'll hear those words, well done, from the Son of God. And on the other side of this cross that they carry, they'd receive the crown. Blessing, I pray, over them. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you give Jesus the glory today? Praise him, would you?